my position at the University of Maryland. Uh, I'm a small fruit pathologist. I'm responsible for disease management on grapes and the small fruit in general. And um, my research program uh, largely focuses on fungicide resistance, and that's the to uh, that's a topic that we uh, that I wanted to talk about. Now, the fungicide resistance is common, right? It's common in fruit raw pathogens. So. As you know, there are three factors that are required for disease infections. Uh, they are conducive environment, right? Presence of pathogen, as well as host. And we do not have a shortage of any of those factors. That's why we need to use fungicide to control the diseases for crop production, right? Um, so intensive sprays speed up resistance selection. And those are, um, you know, um, specialty crops, fruit and the vegetables. Uh, they require intensive uh, um, fungicide input, large fungicide input. And for example, wine grapes, uh, we spray about 12 to 18 times a season. And another factor is the limited chemical classes of fungicides. Now, you think we have a lot of uh, fungicides that we can, we can choose from, but, but really, uh, there is these three fungicide groups. FRAC3, Trizos, Strabulurus, and the SDHI fungicide FRAC7, those uh, make up to 70% of the market share, right? So we have limited uh, fungicide options. And the, with the phasing out of most used pesticides due to some toxicity concerns, due to some public concerns, we even have less that we can use for this management in future. And as a result, fungicide resistance is an would it be uh, getting worse, right? It's a growing concern in future. Now, those are the, uh, speaking of fungicide resistance, those are the mechanisms of fungicide resistance. So I'm not gonna go through one by one. Uh, so in general, there are three different types of mechanisms. You have mutations in the targeted gene, right? That cause the resistance and the overexpression of targeted genes, and the efflux pump, uh, efflux uh, increased efflux pump activities uh, in some organi uh, organisms that cause resistance to uh, fungicides. Um, so uh, we talk about the uh, resistance issues, but how could we better manage fungicide resistance? And uh, those are what I have included in my talk and to hopefully shed some light on resistance management, uh, mainly from an extension perspective of a extension plant pathologist. So monitoring of uh, fungicide resistance and fitness and the competitiveness of uh, resistant phenotypes, and this information would be critical to, uh, uh, to developing resistance management strategies. Um, disease forecasting system, uh, strawberry advisory system, example, um, which allows us to, may allows us to better identify timing of application and to better time fungus applications and we can avoid unnecessary sprays. And importance of uh, accurate species identification, I'll talk about how that helps us with um, uh, resistance management. And at last, I wanted to uh, introduce a smartphone application that we developed to convey some uh, IPM information as well as resistance uh, management um, principles and uh, strategies. So I will use um, strawberry gray mold and, uh, and thracolose and as examples um, throughout my uh, presentation. Now I'll start with strawberry gray mold. Now gray mold is caused by um, Botrytis species, there are two uh, Botrytis species out there affecting strawberries. One is Botrytis cinerae, and the other is Botrytis figariae. Now, the both species, they have great ability to develop fungus and resistance. Um, the temperature, optimal temperature, would be around 68 Fahrenheit, and with prolonged leaf uh, wetness, and those are the favorable disease, favorable conditions, right? Um, the life cycle of strawberry gray mold, um, the infection typically starts at bloom. Uh, in most cases, the bloom uh, infection will not, uh, uh, the symptom of the infection will not show up until the ripening of the fruit. And the disease uh, infection uh, primarily spreads from uh, calyx or decaying petals to fruit, right? 
and there are multiple ways that the pathogen can enter the, to the field. Uh, the first, uh, they can come with a nursery stock in in form of latent infection in uh, crown, in the crown and the leaf tissues, and uh, they can also come by from uh, um, nearby um, small fruit fields such as grapes and the blackberries, and uh, they can also uh, uh, the spores can also be produced from overwintering plant debris. So there are different ways that the pathogen can enter to your field. Um, so this slide that contains all uh, active ingredients, all fungicides currently available for strawberry grain mold control. And in general, uh, there are two different types of fungicides, single side and multi side, right? The botrytis, again, uh, is considered a high risk pathogen for resistance development. Um, uh, FRAC stands for Fungicide Resistance Action Committee. They use different letters, numbers, uh, to de differentiate fungicides with different modes of actions. Right? Now, compared to uh, multi-site, uh, single-site fungicides, they are typically more effective and less toxic. Uh, however, they are more prone to resistance development, uh, whereas multi-site fungicides, they're uh, less prone, uh, they typically don't have resistance concerns, and they are uh, uh, less, a little uh, less effective compared to uh, single-site fungicides, right? Um, so um, a few years ago, we had a program to, um, we had a survey, we did a survey to look at the resistance issues in botrytis isolates from different fields, strawberry fields in Carolinas. Uh, you can say that we found out um, uh, multifungicide resistance right, uh, in botrytis isolates from different strawberry fields, uh, while some farms had more resistance issues other farms had less resistance issues. Now, CCR stands for chemical class resistance. Now, 5CCR, 4CCR, for example, 5CCR means that this individual isolate is resistant to five different chemical classes of fungicides, right? So it's a multi-fungicide resistant isolate. So given uh, this situation, we initiated a program, a um, program to help individual growers um, identify potential resistance issues and make recommendations, spray recommendations based on our monitoring results. And it's a location-specific monitoring program. So what we did, we used those uh, 24 well plates that contain fungicides at different discriminatory concentrations that distinguish sensitive and resistant population, right? And uh, we ask growers to send us strawberry flowers um, due to uh, those dead strawberry flowers due to frost damage. Um, so, um, as you know, strawberry flowers are highly susceptible to grain mold infection. Knowing what products can best protect flowers would be the key to control uh, grain mold. So, we, once we received those strawberry flowers from growers, we incubate them uh, for spiralation. Uh, as soon as we have spores, we transfer them to the plates that we made, right? And then in case of no resistance, uh, you can only say the fungal growth on those control wells, but not on any of those wells, uh, mainly the with fungicides. But in case of high resistance, uh, you can say the growth, fungal growth on all wells, uh, mainly the with fungicides, right? Now, over the years, uh, we generated some data for our own interest. And um, the X, this shows this, uh, shows the frequency of fungicide resistance in botrytis from strawberry flowers from the East Coast, right? Uh, the X axis are different acting gradients. Now, the Y axis is the frequency of um, resistant isolates. Now, uh, this one, siphonomethyl, that's the active ingredient of topsin N, right? In the beginning, we had about 70% isolates with resistance to, um, to topsin N, and then increased to 85, 90%, and became plateaued. And then uh, um, the sec um, this, uh, is, this is a uh, pyroxstrobin, that's the active ingredient in pristine, right? And we had about 20% isolates in the beginning with resistance to uh, to um, uh, pyroxstrobin, and it increased to 50 and 70 percent, and it became plateaued. And the third one, that's uh, phenhexamide, that's active ingredient in Elevate, 
right? And uh, we had about 10% isolates with resistance and increase to 30%. Boscalate, that's active ingredient in uh, pristine, another um, active ingredient in pristine. Uh, over the years, we had about 10 to 30% isolates with resistance to this active ingredient. Now, cyprodinyl, uh, that's active ingredient in switch. Now, you say that we had about 10, 15% isolates with resistance in the beginning, increased to 30, uh, 35 um, per percent. Very similar pattern uh, with other chemical, with other uh, active ingredients. And iprodion, iprodion, that's the uh, active ingredient of Rovera. And we had a very few uh, resistant isolates in the beginning, but the res frequency of resistance increased to uh, 20, 30 percent. Now, the last one, fluodioxonil, uh, this one had the least resistance issues compared to other active ingredients that we tested. The fluodioxonil, that's another component in switch. And um, the sensitive means that those isolates are sensitive to all different uh, active ingredients that we tested. In the beginning, we had more isolates sensitive to all active ingredients, right? And over the years, uh, the frequency um, decreased. The frequency of resistant uh, sensitive isolate decreased. So, in addition to monitoring um, frequency of resistance to different active ingredients, we also look at multi, multi fungicide resistance in this same isolates. Now, the um, x-axis, that's uh, different resistant phenotypes. Again, CCR stands for chemical class resistance, and zero CCR means that this isolate is sensitive, right? One CCR means that this isolate is resistant to only one chemical class. Now, uh, you can say in the beginning, we had more isolates, either sensitive or with resistance to one chemical class. And over the years, um, there is a shift towards multifungicide resistance, right? So there is an increased frequency of multifungicide resistance. So we even had some isolates with resistance to seven different chemical classes of fungicides. Those are super resistant, super strains. Now, if you remember what I uh, said, this we had this program to help our growers better manage fungicide resistance, but why we still observe the shift towards multifungicide resistance. Uh, according to growers who participated in this program, they, um, they all followed our recommendations based on our resistance monitoring um, results. We make recommendations to our growers and they followed the recommendations. But we still observed the shift towards multifungicide resistance. Now, we think that um, the chemical class alternation may not be sustainable for multifungicide resistance management. Okay, so we ask growers to rotate, rotate, to mix and rotate the fungicides with different modes of actions, right, that are still effective based on our resistance monitoring results. But there was a shift to multifungicide resistance. And I know we're all told to spray, to rotate fungicides with different modes of actions that help with resistance management, but, I, but we think in this case, the chemical class alternation is not sustainable, okay? Um, I would explain this um, hypothesis using two different scenarios. The first scenario, uh, scenario one, uh, uh, you had the initial pool, right? In the beginning, you had a pool of isolates um, where the majority of isolates were sensitive but you do have a few isolates with resistance to either fungicide A or fungicide B, right? Fewer isolates even with resistance to both fungicide A and B. Now, if you spray fungicide A, you're selecting for resistance to fungicide A, right? And if you spray fungicide, if you stick with fungicide A without rotating um, with other chemical classes, you're selecting for uh, more isolates with resistance to A. In the end, you will have a pool where most of the isolates are resistant to fungicide A only. But remember that each time you spray, this dual resistant phenotype will be selected, right? So because it's resistant to both A and B, if, if, 
if you spray A, this dual resistance phenotype will be selected. It's a indirect selection rather than being selected by fungi side A directly, right? And scenario two, if you spray fungi side A, you select for resistance to A, and at this point you rotate with fungi side B, right? You're gonna select for fungi side B. In addition, this rotation favors the selection for the dual resistant phenotype, right? So, and then you switch back to A, and you're gonna select for more dual resistant phenotype. So, this rotation speed up the selection for multifungicide resistance. With more frac codes, with more fungicides, with different modes of actions involved in your spray programs, we think it would speed up the selection for multifungicide resistance. Okay, um, so um, you may wonder what would be the mechanism of those multifungicide resistant isolates, right? What would be the molecular basis of resistance in those isolates with different uh, with resistance to different chemical classes. Well, it's an accumulation of mutations in those targeted genes. Those are two uh, individual isolates, isolate A and B. You can say they have different mutations in different targeted genes of different fungicides. For example, this 272R mutation in uh, SDHB gene that confirms resistance to boscalid, that's component in pristine, right? And you also notice that there are different, uh, different mutations in those target genes between those two individual isolates, which suggested that uh, those multifungicide resistant isolates may have evolved independently. Okay, so um, spray fungicide resistance um, monitoring help us adjust our spray programs, right? In the year um, 2011, to uh, 12, uh, the season. We did not have the program, the resistance monitoring program. Growers are, were using Topsan and Pristine, right, uh, for disease control on strawberries. And then uh, once we uh, found uh, the high frequency of resistance to Topsan M, uh, we asked growers to use uh, Activate, uh, Pristine, and Switch. Those are still were effective at that point. And then uh, as soon as we found uh, high frequency um, of resistance to elevate, we asked growers to switch to use switch Marivan. Marivan is one of the newer SDHI fungicides, right? And uh, elevate. So, however, at that point, we still observed the shift towards multifungicide resistance, right? So, we asked growers to, to base their resistance management with captain and siren, those multi-site fungicides that do not select for resistance and only mix with single-site fungicides under high disease pressure. We don't want to use uh, single-site fungicide uh, frequently. I know they are uh, favored in IPM programs, but the disadvantage of those single-site fungicides is that they are much more prone to resistance development. We wanted to preserve the efficacy of single-site fungicides. They are more effective. We wanted to, to use them only when the disease pressure is high and in combination with multi-site fungicides. So uh, we also look at the resistance issue, issue in Botrytis isolates from other small fruits. Uh, in our region, including grapes, uh, raspberries, uh, blackberries, and uh, um, I mean, uh, so uh, you can say the similar, uh, the resistant pattern uh, is pretty uh, similar across different crops, right? Um, in general, Fludeal, Exonio, and those newer SDHI fungicides, they had uh, still had much less resistance issues compared to other uh, active ingredients, fungicides that that were introduced um, 30, 40 years ago. Um, now, uh, we also are, we're also interested in um, studying the fitness cost and the competitiveness of those multi-site fungicide, uh, multi-fungicide resistant isolates. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that lowering the fitness, potential fitness in those multi-fungicide resistant isolates would help us better develop resistance management strategies, right? So we had a field trial where we inoculated uh, blackberry, 
blackberry flowers with Botrytis isolates with different resistant phenotypes. And then during the same year, we, um, we went back to the field and recovered the isolates from the fruit, right? And in the following two years, uh, we did the same. We recovered um, the isolates from the, boat, from the flowers and the fruit. And then we determined the sensitivity of those isolates recovered from fruit and from flowers to different um, uh, active ingredients. And uh, so that we can monitor the population change over time. Now, what we found out was that, um, so in the first year, the year we did the inoculation, right? And you can see uh, the resistant phenotype of the isolates recovered from the flower, uh, from the fruit, uh, was largely consistent with what we inoculated on flowers, right? Those zero CCR from uh, zero CCR plot, majority of the isolates recovered from the fruit in the same year. In the first year, those are um, consistent. The um, resistant phenotype was consistent with uh, uh, was identical with what we inoculated. Now, in the second year, uh, you can see there is a white, there is a variation in phenotypes, right? There are different um, resistant phenotypes, which indicate that what we inoculated um, isolates, the isolates we inoculated were competing with wild population, right? And in the year three, in year three, in the last year, most of isolates were multifungicide resistant, right? were um, resistant to seven different chemical class of fungicides. And during the entire experiment uh, years, we did not spray any fungicide that would select for resistance. This indicate that the multi-fungicide resistant isolate phenotype is, would, be, um, would be as competitive as sensitive population, okay? and even perhaps even more competitive than sensitive population. Um, so, the resistance management strategies, we want to spray less frequently. If we don't spray, then we don't select for resistance, right? And you want to use primarily multi-site fungicides because, because those multi-site multi fungicides, they don't select for resistance. They don't, they're not prone to resistance development. I have not heard any uh, resistance issues with Captain or Siren, right? And use mixtures of multi side and single side fungicides when disease pressure is high. You want to always uh, use, uh, base your disease management with uh, multi side and only uh, tank mixing with single side fungicide when the disease pressure is high. Because single side, in general, they are more effective, right? You want to, uh, to use them under high disease pressure, right? But you don't want to use them frequently. So, um, we um, talk about spraying less frequently, but how could we spray less frequently? So this is a disease forecasting system that uh, utilizes a weather station that determines uh, leaf wetness and temperature in real time to predict infection risks for both Botrytis and Anthracolose. And um, this would uh, reduce fungicide applications by avoiding unnecessary sprays, right? And also, um, um, it improves with reduced fungicide uh, input. It improves resistance management and also save material and the labor cost. Um, this is the website of the, uh, the program, the Strawberry Advisory System. Right? Um, those, each symbol uh, on the picture to the, on the left represent, represents a weather station. Right? And uh, A stands for anthracolose, B stands for botrytis, and you say uh, the green means that you have nothing to worry about. But once it term yellow or red, it means there is an infection risk uh, for either botrytis or anthracolose. And this chart on the right that shows you the infection risk in real time for both diseases. Right? And uh, in other words, you don't need to spray if if you're in a green zone, but once it reaches uh, yellow or red, then you need to spray, spray fungicide. Now, in the past two years, we've been conducting trials, uh, field trials, to validate the efficacy of this uh, forecasting system. 
uh, in the Mid-Atlantic Mid region. Um, uh, we, this, those are the trials we did at the Y on the eastern shore. And 2007, during 2017-18 season, uh, you can say that there was no difference uh, in marketable yield and uh, disease incidence between the SAS treatment and the grower standard, which is a weekly based application uh, spray program. And the SAS reduced the fungus applications, reduced the three fungus applications compared to grower standard. And in the following year, uh, similarly, we did not see a uh, significant difference in marketable uh, yield or disease incidence uh, between two treatments and the SAS reduced about two applications, reduced two applications compared to the grower standard. And uh, however, we did have a trial where we saw some uh, unexpected results associated with SAS treatment. Now, those are the trials we did in Virginia. You can say that the SAS uh, somehow resulted in higher disease incidence as compared to uh, grower standard. Although they, I mean, the SAS reduced the fungus applications by 50%. Um, however, I wanted to point out that during those um, trials, uh, there were a few fungus applications were not made in time. So uh, to, to use the disease forecasting system, uh, we have to spray fungicides. Um, timing is very critical. We have to spray within 48 hours after, after the system is caught spray. So uh, not that we did not um, uh, uh, spray in time uh, on purpose. It's just the soil was uh, very wet, uh, saturated, that prevent uh, fungus applications with tractors, right? So the, again, the system was developed in Florida, and their soil conditions are very different, right? Uh, the, our soils, once they receive over two inches of rain, it can become saturated for quite a few days. So that would potentially prevent uh, a, that would potentially delay SAS fungus applications, right? So we think there are two factors that may contribute to the high disease incidence in the SAS plots. So one, as I uh, mentioned, is a delayed SAS uh, spreads due to saturated soil conditions. The SAS application needs to be made within 48 hours after it's calling for a spray. And the second factor would be microclimates, right? The plant microclimates, uh, especially when row covers are, uh, are deployed. And again, our um, uh, production um, practices are different than Florida. They don't use row covers, but we have to use, use row covers, which might alter the microclimate when the row cover is used. And those microclimates could play a significant role in terms of disease infection. And um, this is just an example, say, with and without a row cover, the temperature can be uh, 20 Fahrenheit different, right? So um, um, last year we had a, uh, we had a, gr a small grant through the Lord Seas IPM Center. Um, to develop a microclimate sensor-based disease forecasting system. Those are the, this is the microclimate uh, sensor that we installed directly into the canopy level so that we can monitor plant microclimates uh, regardless of the de deployment of row covers, right? So uh, um, we're hoping that we can, we can further improve the precision of the disease forecasting for strawberry um, disease management. Now, you can say that's a leaf wetness sensor that is inserted into the canopy. Um, so to make a summary, uh, overall the SAS, the performance of the SAS is acceptable, but you need to spray fungicides in time, right? You have to spray within 48 hours after it's calling for a spray. That's very critical. And the plant microclimates, we think, could play significant roles in disease. Um, in disease infection, but, we, uh, but which needs to be determined. That's, uh, we're we're uh, working on this. Um, and I will uh, move on to cototrican, right? The cototrican species have been, uh, um, have been on, the, on the rise. Now, they cause um, issues on different uh, fruit crops in general. The peach anthracnose, right, cause peach anthracnose, peach cause strawberry anthracnose, cause uh, ripe rot on grapes and cause bitter rot on apples. 
and also cause uh, um, anthracnose on blueberries. So those are those are the diseases caused by the same genus, the, by the species within the same genus. Um, uh, typically, there are multiple species of cultures involved um, uh, in one uh, in one crop. Uh, for example, um, uh, strawberry anthracnose. There are at least three different species affecting strawberry that cause strawberry anthracnose. Uh, so I will um, I will talk more about this later. Um, so, a couple of years ago, uh, we had an outbreak of peach anthracnose in uh, South Carolina. So we uh, uh, we went out and uh, um, uh, collect some isolates from uh, peach fruit, and those we found we found the resistance to FRAC one and FRAC eleven fungicides uh, in some of those uh, isolates. And we know that there are multiple species involved, so we made efforts to, uh, to look at the species uh, diversity, and we found Cototrican Siamense fruticola under Cototrican Galodiosporides. Galodiosporides is a species complex, so there are many species within Galodiosporides. And we only found the resistance in Siamense, not in fruticola, right? And then uh, actatin. Actatin also is a complex, and we found uh, we found out that there are three uh, at least three cultivation species within actatin that uh, cause peach anthracnose. So there are uh, multiple species involved. There are multiple species affecting peach fruit. Now um, under Galodiosporides, you have we have Galodio. Cototrican Siamense, and some of the isolates were found to be resistant to FRAC 1 and FRAC 11. FRAC, uh, FRAC uh, Fraticola, this species, however, we did not detect uh, resistance in any of those isolates. Um, Cototrican Acutate, there were three different species. However, uh, it's noteworthy that the Cototrican Acutate species, they are inherently resistant to FRAC 1. And uh, Cototrican truncatin. And all of those Cototrican species are inherently naturally resistant to most of FRAC7 fungicides. So the control of Cototrican of uh, anthracnose is really is complicated, right? It's complicated by the involvement of multiple species and complicated by the differential sensitivity in different Cototrican species. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, uh, touch, uh, talk a little bit about strawberry anthracnose, right? This has been an increasing concern uh, for many growers in our region. Uh, um, the, the primary source of inoculant is considered to be nursery stock, right? Latent infection in nursery stock, that would be the um, uh, primary source of inoculant for the disease. And the disease is dispersed by water splash, water splash. So um, uh, it has, the pathogen has a biotrophic stage. Uh, so the simpleton does not show up until the uh, ripening of the fruit. And um, the pathogen can also uh, survive uh, uh, in the soil, right? In the soil for up to a year, depending on your con soil condition. The drier the soil is, the longer the pathogen can survive. Um, now, uh, we uh, in the past two um, uh, years, we collecting isolates from Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and uh, North Carolina as well. We uh, so far collected about 200 isolates, and and we also uh, look at the species composition um, uh, of those isolates, and we found out that there are at least four different cultivation species affecting strawberries. Now, under Cototrican acutatin, we have a Cototrican Lymphae, Fiorini, right? Under Galodiosporides, there is a Cototrican Siomensi, and there is another one, Cototrican Lineola. I right? only got one isolate of Lineola. And acutatin is known to be a fruit rot passenger, as Galodiosporides is known to be the crown rot passenger. Now, those isolates were collected from the fruit, crumbs, petals, and the runners. And this diagram that shows, shows you different cultivation species from recovered from different organs of strawberry plant. Right? You say from the fruit, we have cultivation lymphae and uh, uh, fiorini. And from the crown, we have lymphae, um, 
silency and uh, lining all leaning all uh, Lotte will say that the both nymphae and the fiorini they are actitatin species they are within actitatin however uh, from the crown we have both actitatin and gallodiosporides silmense is within gallodiosporides and nymphae is within a cortotrican actitatin and from the runners and petals uh, we have uh, called Tortrican Nymphae. Nymphae. You can say that the Nymphae is the overwhelming majority, right? The, most of our isolates turn out to be Nymphae, and it's all over the place. It can infect the fruit, the crown, and the petals and uh, runners as well. Um, the, we also look at the resistance issues. Um, uh, resistance to QI fungicides in those called Tortrican isolates from strawberries. Uh, we have uh, again, 200 isolates. Now, um, uh, about 40% of the isolates were resistant to strobulurins, to QI fungicides, right? Among the eight, um, um, out of the 80, among the 80 isolates with QI resistance, um, uh, the majority of those isolates were uh, highly resistant to strobulurins with the typical mutation G143A inside the crown B gene. That's the target of that's the target of the QI fungicide, which indicate that the um, you know the the resistance to QI fungicides is pretty widespread, and and um, those are the fungicides labeled for. Um, for anthracolose control, for strawberry anthracolose control, you can say that we have very, very limited fungicide options. And most of those fungicides, they are FRAC11, 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 right? The FRAC11 is the primary fungicide recommended for strawberry anthracolose. However, resistance now is widespread. What else we can, what else, what other fungicide options would be? What else we can use? Now, well, Captain and the Switch, they are effective to some extent, but not as effective as strawberry neurons if resistance is, uh, is not a concern, right? Uh, and both switch and captain, they do not have systemic activity. So they were not able to really cure the disease. They may help to some extent uh, berries from uh, infection, healthy berry from infection. So uh, now, what what other fungicides that we can use for strawberry anthracose management, right? Remember, uh, some of the isolates are resistant to FRAC1, FRAC11, and most isolate cototrican species are resistant, naturally resistant to most of FRAC7 fungicides, right? Uh, FRAC1, FRAC11, FRAC7, those are the main chemical classes we have in the toolbox, but you know, what else, what, what, what else we can do? How about FRAC3, DMI fungus, FRAC3, try those. Can we use trials for the control of anthracolose? Well, try those have not been recommended for strawberry anthracolose management uh, because they are, in general, less effective, right? And, however, there have been some newer uh, trials, newer DMI fungicides labeled for um, for strawberries and uh, other um, crop disease management. We're hoping that there might be a few uh, DMI fungicides that might be effective against those cototrican species. So we determined the sensitivity of different cototrican species to different um, active ingredients of um, trisos, um, like defenconazole, polyconazole, defen um, tepoconazole, flu trifluoro, femboconazole, right? So you can say that the, the y-axis is the EC50 value. The bar, the higher the bars are, the less uh, effective the fungicide would be. Now, you can say there is a as a differential sensitivity between those uh, cototrican species and also differential efficacy between those uh, um, um, FRAC3, between those uh, active ingredients against the same cototrican species. So, um, so uh, why there is a um, like differential sensitivity between those cototrican species? All right, so this uh, gets a little um, detailed, uh, a little basic science. Now, what we found out that was, um, remember we talk about the uh, target gene of different fungicides, right? The DMI fungicides, the target of the DMI fungicide is CYP51 gene. Now, this gene actually has two paralogs in cototrican species, CYP51A and CYP51B. And um, this 
basically we use a, uh, we did a uh, yeast complementation experiment that to prove both uh, CYP51A and CYP51B, they can function independently, okay, in cultured species. So in other words, they can compensate the function of each other. Now, the deletion of CYP51A and if or CYP51B in crototrican species led to increased sensitivity to some but not all DMI fungicides, indicating that those DMI fungicides may have differential binding affinity for those two CYP51 paralogs. Make sense, right? And uh, this might help with uh, understanding now this is a cultural species, right? It has a two paralogs of one gene, which is a target my fungicides. Now this is DMI one, right? It can bind DMI CYP fifty one A very well, but it cannot bind CYP fifty one B. And DMI two, another DMI fungicide, it can bind DMI uh, CYP fifty one B very well, but it cannot bind CYP fifty one A. Remember? The species, the fungus only need one paralog to survive, right? Those two paralogs, they function independently, and the passenger only need one. So it's enough, it's not enough to just kill one paralog. You have to kill both. Now, what if we, we mix them together? Would there be any sort of energy, right? Would there be any synergy if we mix different DMI fungicides together? together for anthracnose control. This is an in vitro um, study that we did to look at the sensitivity of combinations of different DMI fungicides for, uh, for cultural control. And indeed, uh, we observed synergy um, uh, for uh, certain combinations of DMI fungicides. Uh, the bar, there is a red line, right? Uh, once the bar is above the red line, that indicates there is a synergy. The higher the bars are, the synergy, the stronger the synergy is. So similar pattern was observed for the other species in Fei. Um, so summer, uh, summary, uh, anthracnose disease in the same crop can often be caused by multiple cultural species. Now species uh, sensitivity varies between cultural species, and we think CYP51A and CYP51B likely mediate mediate sensitivity to DMIs in cultural nymphae and fiorinae. Now field trials are needed to to really validate the efficacy, the synergy of the DMI mixtures for anthracnose management. Um, well, I mean, I'm interested in DMI fungicides because DMI fungicides have very strong uh, systemic activity, like strobilurins, right? Switch, Captain, they have a somewhat efficacy, but they do not have systemic activity. I'm particularly interested in uh, using the DMI, promising mixtures of DMIs uh, for strawberry um, plugs, transplants, right? If the transplants, we're talking about, you know, the, the transplants would be the, uh, the primary source of inoculum for anthracnose. So if we treat the transplants with the mixtures of DMIs, and that would, uh, uh, that would uh, reduce the initial inoculum, which might in turn help with disease management. And the DMIs are not, are not used frequently in strawberry production and do not have cross-resistance issues with other existing fungicides used on strawberries. So um, at last, I will uh, introduce the app that we developed for, um, uh, for uh, fruit crops uh, management, uh, for fruit crops production. Now, what we had in mind was to develop an app that can facilitate the communications of um, uh, IPM information and uh, fungicide resistance um, management strategies and the principles when you have a long list of active ingredients, right? That sometimes can be very confusing. Uh, and if you grow multiple crops, that uh, even uh, more confusing. So the main feature of this app uh, include active ingredients um, and the treatment tables and high quality disease pictures, uh, fungicide efficacy, including PHI, REI, uh, rate per acre, uh, that information as well, and some information regarding pest biology. Um, 
these are the active, active contributors to this app. We initially developed this app for peach and strawberry. Now the app has been expanded to include more crops. Um, to give an example, this is the, the app, right? Gray mode. This have some information about gray mode, uh, general information, and the disease pictures that help you with disease uh, identification diagnosis in the field. And the main feature of the app is active ingredient table. Active ingredient table, right? We listed all active ingredients that are currently labeled for gray mode control, uh, for example. And those are the labeled active ingredients. They're color coded by their frac codes and also uh, efficacy information is also available and can be ranked from high to low and low to high for each of the active ingredient labeled for the disease. Um, if you are not familiar with active ingredients, uh, but you are interested in this one because it has the highest efficacy rating, and you just click on this active ingredient and it will lead you to the treatment that contains the active ingredient. In this case, it's pristine, right? Then this also shows you the rate per acre. Uh, the half of the table is, a, the portion of a, this table is a slideable, and it also has more information about this treatment. Rate per acre, pH, I, R, E, I. So this app is free of charge, right? And um, uh, we think this might be a good uh, supplemental to our spray guides, to our production guides. You can, um, you can. The idea is to have a tool where you can, you can access all those information anytime, anywhere.